Okay. Thank you very much. It's, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here to share some of my uh, views about social uh, insurance reform, pension reform uh, in Chile. The reforms in Chile that began uh, uh, more than 35 years ago have been an interest to uh, economists all over the world. Uh, I have to say I'm glad uh, that Chile undertook those experiments rather than we in the United States. Um, the, uh, I've been involved and interested in the issue of, of social security reform, uh, not only as an academic, but also when I was chair of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Clinton, uh, we had extensive discussions of social security uh, reform, pension reform. And then later, when I was uh, chief economist of the World Bank, uh, we continued uh, those discussions. Uh, and I'm going to refer in a moment uh, to a, a study that I did while I was uh, chief economist. Uh, my remarks today, though, are going to be focusing particularly on the lessons that emerged from the global financial crisis. Because I think the global financial crisis provided us a, a considerable insight into uh, the nature of financial markets. And I think on the basis of that, those insights, uh, we need to rethink, uh, to a large extent, the role of the private sector and the role of government uh, in uh, every aspect of how they interact with individuals, including uh, old age uh, retirement. Okay, so the 2008 financial crisis was a cataclysmic event from which we have learned much about financial markets and about risk management. Uh, what I'm going to do in this talk, explore some of the lessons and their implications for certain aspects of the reform of Chile's pension system. I want to emphasize that I'm only going to be able to touch on a limited number of issues. And finally, uh, towards the end of my talk, I'm going to discuss some further insights into pension reform from recent advances in behavioral economics. Uh, these advances have led us to rethink uh, the ability of individuals to manage risk, to manage savings uh, to manage uh, problems of uh, uh, ability of, of making decisions over long periods uh, of time. Of course, even before the crisis, the role of privately funded pension funds, I believe, had been oversold. And uh, I, I wrote about that rather extensively in uh, some work that I did with uh, Peter Orzak, who was later uh, to become uh, the head of the Office of uh, Management Budget under uh, President Obama. Uh, we explained in that paper uh, that most of the arguments that have been put forward for a privately managed defined contribution second pillar uh, were, av were just wrong. And of course, that had uh, strong implications uh, for those countries that have based their old age pensioning system on the third pillar model. Uh, we argued, we urged that countries that had tried that form should rethink their system. This of course was done before the 2008 crisis. We wrote that paper uh, uh, at the end of the 90s. Uh, I, the crisis, I think, uh, reinforced uh, the conclusions we ra reached and, and suggested in some ways that we had been, uh, in some ways, uh, prescient. I'm not going to go through all the aspects of the um, uh, what we pointed out in that paper, but we focused our attention on three sets of myths, one involving macroeconomic myths, the second involving microeconomic myths, and the third involving myths about political economy. The macroeconomic myths focused around the idea that a private system 
would be superior to a pay-as-you-go system, that individual accounts would raise national savings, that the rate of return are higher under individual accounts, that the fact that declining rates of return on pay-as-you-go systems reflected fundamental problems. We showed that all of those conclusions were in fact wrong. And by the same token, we showed that there were a whole set of microeconomic myths. Uh, the idea that labor market incentives are better under individual accounts was wrong, or that these defined benefit plans necessarily lead to earlier retirement. And perhaps most relevant to what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, we show that the idea that competition would ensure low administrative costs under individual accounts was also wrong. At the time, we had only limited data, but the data that we had was very forceful. We looked at, for instance, the UK, and we showed that in the case of UK, pensions had been reduced by as much as 40% as a result of the high administrative costs that prevailed under the uh, private pillar, under the private second pillar uh, of the UK system. And finally, there are a set of political economy myths that suggested that were used by some people to argue that uh, um, the uh, private uh, second pillar would be superior to a public. Uh, the uh, fact is that uh, what we've seen is that in, uh, a lar uh, political economy problems actually have plagued the private system even more than the public systems. So let me review for a moment some of the ways in which the private financial system has failed in the 2008 crisis. Uh, it, it should have been clear that the, final, the financial system did not function well then. But we now realize that it was not functioning well before the crisis and it has not been functioning well since. It's one of the reasons why recoveries, both in Europe and the United States, have been so slow. I want to highlight six fundamental problems that were revealed. The first was that the private financial system did not manage risk well. In fact, it created the risks. And of course, it did not allocate resources well. The second is that it provided very bad advice. Some of that bad advice was based on mere incompetence, but some of it was based on conflicts of interest on the fact that I'll come to in a little bit later that the profits of the financial se sector are maximized when transaction costs are maximized. But of course, that's just the opposite of what retirees want. They want to minimize transaction costs. But more generally, we saw that the private financial sector was rife with conflicts of interest. And they showed up in every aspect of what went on uh, in the financial sector. We also seen, and particularly uh, many of these problems were exposed even more after the crisis, and they've continued even until today, what we've seen is massive fraud, massive market manipulation, and a whole host of other bad practices. These uh, practices were and continue to be pervasive. Fifthly, we see that there's been a lack of competition. The market is far from what one would describe as characterized by a high level of competition. And the result is above competitive equilibrium levels of charges. And that leads to the sixth problem, one which is particularly germane to pension programs, and that is there are high transaction costs enriching the financial sector at the expense of the rest of the economy. In fact, it's a negative sum game. The cost of these mistakes to the U.S. economy and to the global economy 
and to families in America and around the world have, of course, been enormous. I've calculated the cost of the crisis in the United States alone as in the trillions, and in Europe, it's another several trillion. I want to focus, though, today on pensions, on old age pensions. It's interesting that uh, in the years before the crisis, President Bush had tried to uh, push an idea that was similar to the Chile's uh, second pillar private system. It was a partial privatization of our, uh, of our, uh, of our social security system, our old age system. Today, virtually all Americans are thankful that he failed because if he had not failed, Americans' uh, old age would be in jeopardy. They would be worse than they already are. In the case of Chile, there have been huge fiscal costs. The state had to bail out the financial sector uh, and, and pensions. The state had to pay the very high cost of transition to a funding system and then act as a guarantee or the last resort during the crisis, subsidizing pension top subs since the taxpayer had to pay twice. Uh, all of this has important implications for the topic that we're talking about this, uh, this, uh, today, the reliance in the private sector in the second pillar, which is an important part of the national pension programs. I feel particularly uh, uh, sensitive to the issue because it was the World Bank that pushed around the world this kind of idea. Uh, those countries that adopted that program, to a large extent, have come to regret it. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. Of course, in the years before the crisis, uh, many of the problems that I talked about had been somewhat anticipated. And it was hoped that regulations would at least mitigate or prevent these problems from manifesting themselves. But it should be obvious that regulations fail to do that. Even when there were laws in place which gave the regulator authority to act, the regulators didn't enforce them. There was a problem of regulatory capture. Sometimes talk about it. Even when the regulator was not from the financial sector, and typically they were, there was a problem of what we referred to as cognitive capture. Moreover, the financial sector was enormously clever in evading the regulations that existed. But the financial sector has also been very successful in limiting the scope of regulation. And this is true even after the failings have been exposed. And this is what I said when I said that there are political economy problems uh, in the private financial sector, this is precisely what I'm talking about. Uh, there are problems both in the implementation and, uh, of regulations and in the design of the appropriate regulations. What we want of a public pension program is to provide a modicum of old age security. Public social security programs do this. They insure, for instance, against the risk of inflation. It's very hard, almost impossible, to get a private uh, annuity that insures against the risk of inflation. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was uh, on the Council of Economic Advisors, I pushed hard to, for the creation of inflation-indexed bonds. And the private sector actually resisted that. Even the US Treasury resisted it. But fortunately, we succeeded. But the most important thing is that with public pension programs, retirees don't have to worry about the fluctuations in the stock or bond market or the short-term interest rate. In fact, public pension programs can even prevent what's sometimes called relative deprivation by adjusting payments to changes in wage, wage levels more generally. This is particularly important when there is high rates of growth because then the old age, those of the older people can fall well behind uh, uh, the incomes of workers. Uh, 
old a public pension programs are based on solidarity and collective financing and can have thus positive redistribution effects. Let me spend a few moments talking about the failure of the private programs in risk management. The defined contribution programs that have become prevalent in the United States and part of Chile and most many other countries that went to this uh, contributory private second pillar did none of these things. For instance, those retiring in 2008 were exposed to enormous risk as a result of the collapse of stock market prices. And what this did was to compound the problem posed by the collapse of the housing prices, which was the other principal asset for most Americans. Making things worse is what happened after the 2008 crisis. The United States and now Europe engaged in quantitative easing. But quantitative easing made it clear that there were no private assets that individuals could buy that would protect them, that would enable them to have a modicum of old age security in the old age. Those who invested in stocks saw their wealth evaporate. Those who had been more prudent, who had held their wealth in supposedly safe government T-bills, saw their income evaporate as government brought down the interest rates, first on short-term and then on long-term bonds, close to zero. The failure of private markets in uh, management of risk is compounded by the failure in the advice on risk management. Uh, this is seen most clearly in the case of the mortgage market, where we can see very clearly the consequences of their bad advice. But the, the implications are also clear. Uh, the bad advice was also given in the case of pensions. Uh, there it's harder to, to see as transparently how bad the advice was. Uh, if we had more time, I could go into it. But in the case of mortgages, we the private financial sector encouraged households to move into balloon mortgages and other risky financial partly uh, financial products. Uh, some of this really bad advice was based on incompetence. Uh, it was very clear that those in the financial markets didn't understand risk. And that was true even of some of the senior people in the financial sector. But part of the problem is, I think, they didn't really want to understand risk. That wasn't their motivation. Their motivation was making ma money. And there were rampant conflicts of interest. As I said before, the incentive of those in the financial sector is simply to maximize the income. But they have continued to resist regulations which will curb their bad practices. For instance, President Obama has, impo has proposed imposing minimal standards on the financial sector for pensions. He's proposed imposing what we call fiduciary standards. Uh, the evidence is that in the US, the failure even today to abide by such fiduciary standards is costing retirees tens of billions of dollars a year. But the private financial sector is resisting the adoption of these basic fiduciary standards. Again, re-emphasizing the problem, the political economy problems that I mentioned earlier. Another set of problems is that they are actively engaged in what my colleague, uh, good friend George Akerlof, who shared the Nobel Prize with me, uh, has called fishing for fools, looking for people they could take advantage of. Profit can be increased more, more by doing that by act, than actually providing services that actually help people manage the risk. This is reflected in the fact that the private financial sector actively engaged in discriminatory and predatory lending practices. The result of this is that they've had to pay huge fines. And we're talking here not about small banks, we're talking about America's leading banks. And they paid fines and 
in the millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars. But that doesn't make up for the devastation to, on the lives of those who suffered from their discriminatory and predatory lending practices, from their bad advice, from their bad risk management. Finally, I want to come and spend a minute on behavioral economics, which is one of the most exciting branches of economics today. Behavioral economics has emphasized that the kinds of models that economists used in the past, where they assumed rational behavior and rational expectation, simply don't give a good description of individual behavior. They particularly provide bad descriptions of people's behavior in the face of risk, in the face of intertemporal choices, choices over time. Behavior economics has provided new insights into the limitations in individuals' ability to judge risk and make these kinds of savings decisions. One of the things that it's pointed out is that often incentives get distorted and that individuals can easily be influenced. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as they can be easily nudged. Of course, the objective the objective of advertising is to move individuals to buy products that have higher transaction costs, that maximize the revenue of those in the financial sector. Sad fact is that the financial sector has truly excelled in exploiting these market irrationalities and looking for those they can most profitably exploit. Uh, the irony, of course, is that Sometimes they've been hoisted on their own petard, as happened in the uh, subprime mortgages uh, that they issued uh, in their attempt to take advantage of uh, uh, those uh, uh, poor Americans who were financially uh, uh, not very sophisticated. All of this highlights the importance of public programs uh, and the importance of what are called defaults, public defaults, uh, provisions that help nudge, guide people to make decisions that are in their long run interest and that will help them manage these very difficult problems of managing risk uh, over their lifetime. Well, the consequence of the reliance on the private sector in the second pillar have been seen in Chile and in many other countries. There's poor coverage, high levels of insecurity and in retirement, significantly lower pension incomes. I mentioned before, example in the UK where we've looked at the calculations and pensions are 40% lower because of the high transaction costs, there are high fiscal costs, and greater inequality, a subject, of course, about which I've been greatly concerned in recent years, and a subject which those in Chile should be great, greatly concerned because Chile happens to be one of the OECD countries with the highest level of inequality. And all these have uh, had all to the, uh, uh, while everybody in society has been paying these huge costs, uh, the real winner has been the financial sector. All of this has done, been to enhance the income of the financial sector. But let me emphasize, this is a negative sum game. What the financial sector wins is far outshadowed by the losses to the rest of society, which is why it's so important to move away from the private second pillar. There are alternatives. Uh, and as we look around the world, particularly as we look at what has happened in recent years, we see a large number of successful alternatives. Uh, Canada has created a, a government fund, considerable independence, which has achieved high returns, low volatility, low transaction costs, and has shown that you can create such a fund immune from political influence. Similarly, there are a large number of successful sovereign wealth funds and government-run pension funds, which again have established uh, a, a track record of delivering 
for, the, for retirees and for the benefits of citizens more broadly. Uh, these pension systems have low transaction costs and good customer service. In fact, if you look around the world, about 23 countries privatized pensions in earlier decades. But in recent years, about seven of those countries have reversed, partially or fully renationalized their pension systems, uh, and several other countries are reconsidering are considering doing so today. So this brings me to uh, my policy recommendations. I think what is needed is a stronger first pillar necessary to avoid old age poverty and provide a minimal level of old age security. Uh, the second, really the focus of my remarks uh, today, has been on creating a public, let me emphasize, a public second pillar. That public second pillar needs to have an important redistributive component, topping up in effect the contributions of low income individuals. There should be some element of intergenerational smoothing, avoiding relative old age poverty, which is especially important in economies where incomes are growing. There should be an important defined benefit, benefit or what you might call an insurance component, which means smoothing out stock market and interest rate volatility and providing some insurance against inflation. I believe that government has a responsibility for macroeconomic management and therefore should be partially accountable for consequences of macroeconomic fluctuations. There is a difficult issue of the transition Transition before that Chile faced was a transition from a pay-as-you-go system to uh, the current system. Now, though, it needs to be a transition from the current system to this new public system. I think that's, that transition it will be much easier, but one should think about a voluntary transition of those ex in existing investment vehicles to uh, 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 this new program. The standard... Uh, policy recommendation of the World Bank and uh, pension experts around the world talked about uh, a third pillar, a voluntary pillar. I believe that an important component of that should be a public option or public options. Uh, there should be at least an alternative investment vehicle where individuals can feel secure that transaction costs are low, that they are not being preyed upon, that they're not being taken advantage of. Uh, in the way that the private system has demonstrated uh, to be its hallmark. Uh, there can be alternative options with uh, different risk characteristics, allowing individuals in different circumstances to opt for more or less risk. But I do think that there needs to be better guidance on risk management, certainly better guidance than the private sector gave uh, in the years before the crisis. Finally, I think there needs to be better regulation of all investment vehicles. I mentioned in the, United, the, the attempt in the United States to, to require, to impose fiduciary standards. I mentioned uh, the pushback that the private financial sector uh, is giving to these efforts. Um, but I think there are some important uh, instruments that government should take, uh, take advantage of. Uh, one of these is to say, uh, if you are going to be eligible for favorable tax treatment, you have to have, uh, you have to conform to high fiduciary standards, uh, transaction costs have to be low, there have to be strong disclosure requirements and so forth. So let me conclude. <clears throat> we know, we knew actually before the crisis that markets with imperfect and asymmetric information are often neither efficient nor stable. The crisis of 2008 just reinforced that conclusion. Financial markets have emphasized, have illustrated these problems. Uh, financial markets also illustrated how asymmetric information can give open up opportunities for some to exploit others, for some to take advantage of the others. And the financial sector did this, uh, did this uh, in in very large measure. Uh, the crisis, in fact, exposed the depths of the problems, 
and the investigations of the financial sector in the aftermath of the crisis exposed even more problems. There are, I believe, huge costs to not having a good pension program. The problem cost in terms of insecurity, old age poverty, inequality. And there can even be large macroeconomic consequences. A good pension program can act like a built-in automatic stabilizer. The kinds of programs that we've been moving to, defined contribution programs, defined contributions that are uh, run by the private sector, like the private second pillar, actually operate as built-in automatic destabilizers, exacerbating macroeconomic uh, fluctuations. It should be clear, both in Chile and in many other countries, that current arrangements are inadequate. The reforms that I've outlined uh, above, uh, I hope, provide a framework of thinking about how one can move towards creating a much better system. I hope my, these remarks are helpful in your discussions, uh, in your deliberations, in trying to uh, uh, reform Chile's pension program. Chile led the way in uh, an experiment and creating a private second pillar. I hope it leads the way now in creating a new kind of pension based in the public sector that will provide a kind of security, a kind of uh, uh, fight against inequality and old age poverty that will again serve as an example to the rest of the world. Thank you.